Before going on to describe my modified treatment of heart attacks, I mentioned earlier how, as a teenager, my father had taught me much about general practice. More formal attempts to understand the psychodynamics of general practice were being made at that time. A group of general practitioners chaired by Dr. Michael Ballant, a consultant psychiatrist at the Tavistock Clinic, set out to explore the doctor-patient relationship in a series of research seminars. The first fact that they observed was one that was already well known. That was that by far the most frequently used drug in general practice was the doctor himself. It was not only the medicine that mattered, but the way the doctor gave it to the patient. Indeed, the whole ambience in which the drug was given and taken. They then went on to observe that the pharmacology of this important drug called doctor was unknown. No guidance whatsoever was given in any textbook as to the dosage in which a doctor should prescribe himself, in what form, how frequently, and what his curative and maintenance doses were. Neither were there any indications about possible hazards of this medication. Adverse reactions in individual patients, or side effects such as tolerance or dependence. Ballant published his book, The Doctor, His Patient and the Illness, in 1957. But I didn't browse it until I'd came, come back from the Arctic. Then in 1963, Avram Goldstein, professor of pharmacology at Stanford University in California, pointed out that in order for opiates to have a therapeutic effect, there must be receptors for them in the central nervous system. The only possible reason for opiate receptors to exist must be to respond to opiate produced naturally within the body as part of everyday existence. I first learned of this reasoning in 1966. One could therefore deduce that the sedative effect of the drug called doctor was produced by stimulating naturally occurring opiate in the body. A couple of decades later, naturally occurring opiates called endorphins were actually identified. Some years later still, naturally occurring, occurring cannabis was found too and called anandamide. The difference between opiates that are administered and the drug called doctor lies in the fact that when the drug is injected, it floods the body indiscriminately, producing a wide range of effects. One of those is to depress respiration, causing death. The reason why opiates are dangerous is because the margin between the therapeutic dose and the, the, the lethal dose is very small. Another effect of opiates is to produce the withdrawal symptoms of anxiety and irritability as the drug wears off. It was as if the drug called doctor, on the other hand, stimulated the body's own opiate, thus making the patient feel more secure. This opiate then acted only at the appropriate nerve endings without causing side effects. It must be the opiate-like effect of the drug called doctor that lies at the root of the placebo effect, whereby inert medicines can cure illness. It must also lie at the root of all alternative therapies, no matter how weird and wonderful they may be. When viewed this way, there are many similar drugs. There are drugs called husband, wife, father, granddad, granny, uncle, aunt, brother, sister, and friend, not to mention teacher, lawyer, and servant, they are all capable of producing a feeling of well-being. However, the, by far the most important and powerful of these drugs is the drug called mother. It is an ultimate in sedatives. If a mother expresses her maternal warmth physically, intellectually, and emotionally, openly and freely rather than grudgingly, then a happy home where children can grow and develop their full potential 
without becoming alcoholics, drug addicts or delinquents is virtually guaranteed. Medicine transcends politics. It has been forgotten that when viewed clinically rather than politically, the genders are complementary, not equal. I'm very sorry if this observation offends anyone. Bye.